Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, thank you all for attending this session, the Holistic Health and Empath Empathic Communication for Healthcare Professionals. I'm so excited to be here to have these two very accomplished women here presenting to us. I ask that you give them your undivided attention. Um, as you know, being in healthcare means that you are a lifetime learner. Um, when it comes to procedures, medical knowledge, treatment, workup, you know, we're all very proficient in that. But some things that we often overlook are things like interpersonal communication, empathy, um, these kind of skills that are you know, not really practiced as much. Here to help us delve deeper into these skills are um, Dr. Tasneemben Kagalwala and Zainab bin Izzi Shipshanda. Dr. Tasneemben, this is gonna be kind of long. She is an international neuro-linguistic programming training association certified life coach, motivational speaker, author, She's written several articles. She is the first, first American board certified neuro-linguistic programming master practitioner, hypnotherapist, and trainer in the state of Texas, um, which is amazing. She works with all ages. <laughs> she works with uh, people of all ages, specializing in corporate workshops, teens, families, and relationship coaching. She's passionate about mental health. Um, and she also has her own radio show, which is really cool. She is on once a week, Wednesdays, um, in here in Dallas. And um, she also wanted me to say that she strongly believes that you are everything you choose to be. So there we go. And really quickly, um, Zana Bin Izzy Chandler is a public health professional, professional and master certified, master certified health education specialist. She has her own company, the ZFR, ZRF Group, where she works with clients to co-develop health educational materials and programming that incorporate patient and community needs and preferences. Prior clients have included public health authorities, community-based organizations, and nonprofit foundations. She's established thought leadership in health literacy as an invited speaker uh, with the Academy of Communication and Healthcare and the Public Health Epidemiology Conversations podcast. She also serves as a peer reviewer for the Journal of Patient Experience. I cannot think of two better people to present on these topics. So with a round of applause, let's begin. All righty, ahlan wa salan, uh, esteemed professionals, trust me not sab. And ladies and gentlemen, it is truly my honor to be here today and stand before you as a mental health practitioner. And yes, as Ali Asgarbhai um, generously gave my introduction, thank you for that, Ali Asgarbhai. I am here to share with you the transformative power of integrating the mind-body connection into medical practice, not only for patient care, but also for your own personal well-being. So now, you could be thinking, you could be thinking that why? Why do I need to know more about the mind-body connection? Uh, I already uh, know more than enough. I don't need to know anything more about it. And if I were to be honest, that's what I thought when I started into this field. And that takes me back to my late 20s when I had probably hit rock bottom, both personally and professionally. Professionally, I had lost a job due to some office politics. And personally, I was uh, getting out of a toxic engagement. So at that point of time, I did what I knew best. At that time, I did what I knew best about the mind-body connection. I put on a fake smile. I distracted myself with healthy distractions, and I went about my life. And to be honest, it did work. Uh, for some months, it did work. When four months later, a gentle nudge from my mother pointed out that I was gaining a lot of weight. That led to a doctor's visit, and I had um, high cholesterol, high BP, and I was obese. During that time, there was a family wedding going on, and you know how, badda kaka, kaki, badda, badda, avigela, and you know, you take that one happy family picture at the end of that wedding. And I was the only one who wanted to not be there and somehow disappear and not take that picture. Well, nonetheless, I did stand there and take it. 
But later, that picture was sent as a memento of the wedding to all the aunts, uncles, and everyone. And I remember very clearly sitting in my living room and looking at myself in that picture. Yes, I was smiling, but my eyes were blank. My hands were stiff by my side. And I was looking at myself thinking, this cannot be me. This is not me. And I think for me, that was my aha moment. When I was looking at myself from the outside, everything seemed to be OK. I was going on with life. But when I looked at myself from the inside out, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. When I looked at myself from the inside out, that was for the very first time that I understood the true meaning of the mind-body connection. Uh, until I didn't take care of my mental health, none of the fake smiling would help. Just like in your medical practice, and I remember I had one uncle once who would always say, Kai bhi thai jao, doctor paase jao shai. Shardi thai jao, tumhane doctor paase jao shai. Baathu ruke to doctor paase lai jao. And he would have all the tablets in the world, and he would be popping those pills, but he would still complain, saying, I don't feel good. So that goes to prove that, in a sense, the mind-body connection underscores the inseparable relationship between our mental and physical states. Now, how many of us go about our life pretending everything is OK? Because we, that's the way we have been brought up. Okay, put on a smile, face it, carry on, and things will become OK. Until something dramatic or drastic happens in our lives that truly wakes us up to the true meaning of the mind-body connection and its mental and physical issues. Now, if we are all honest with ourselves, we will all agree that we can benefit from a heightened awareness of the mind-body connection because, be it at work, with family, or in solitude, we can all lead much more successful lives as a result of that. So therefore, today, I have for you three unique and practical ways in which you can integrate this approach into your life. The first amongst them is what we call anchoring positive emotions. Now, this is an NLP technique, a neuro-linguistic programming technique, which is what? This technique allows you to associate an internal positive emotion with an external trigger, stimulus or anchor. Now, I'm going to demonstrate this technique for you in a little bit. And for that demonstration, as the external trigger, stimulus, or anchor, I'm going to be using the first knuckle of your left hand. And I will show you how it's done, so just bear with me as I explain it. So what's going to happen? <laughs> You're going to join in with me on this one. So what we're going to do is, when I count one, two, three, we all together are going to say the words, good morning. Simple two words, good morning. But what are we going to do when we say those words? When we say those words, I would like you to please internally access the positive emotion of, let's go with feeling motivated and charged. So when you're associating a positive emotion with an external anchor or trigger, it can be any emotion. I'm choosing to go with feeling motivated and charged today. But you could say, no, this thing, when I want to feel calm and zen. You could go with that. If you say, no, I just want to feel joyful and grateful, you could go with that. But for the purpose of this demonstration today, we will go with feeling motivated and charged. I think we can all do uh, with a little bit of that. We still have uh, the whole afternoon to go through. So when I say the words one, two, three, and you all, we all will join in together and say good morning, while you're saying good morning, I want you to internally access how it feels to feel totally motivated and charged. I'm sure that brings an image to mind. You must have felt totally motivated and totally charged at some point of time in your life. And if anyone here says, nahi, me to koi var chuche motivation khabar aj nati mero amat chu, then I would say, imagine. Imagine what it feels like to feel totally motivated and totally charged. Now, I have one request here. When you're imagining, make it loud and big. Exaggerate that feeling. 
see what you see, hear what you hear, feel what you feel, blow that feeling out. How would it feel to feel totally motivated and totally charged? Yeah, blow it out in your mind. You don't need to do it the way I did it. But when I say the words one, two, three, we're all going to say good morning, you're going to be accessing that internal emotion then. Then what happens is once you've said it, I will say the word touch. When I say the word touch, and only when I say the word touch, you will take your forefinger of your right hand and touch the first knuckle of your left hand. Now, the touch is not a feather touch. The touch is not a touch where you feel like, oh my God, what am I doing? It's a touch which has got a little bit of pressure. It's not too strong. It's not too soft. Okay, so you will say touch. Let's just do it one time to get a hang of it, and then I will explain what happens later. Okay, so on the count of three, Zainab, when you're joining me, right? Mm -hmm. One, two, no, I'll say touch, then you touch. Right now we're just saying good morning. When I say touch, then you're touching. One, two, three. Good morning! Touch. Release. Humor me. Let's do it once more. One, two, three, again I'm going to say good morning. You're going to say good morning with me. You're going to internally access that feeling of being totally motivated, totally charged. You're going to blow it up. You're going to see what you see, hear what you hear, feel what you feel, make it large, exaggerate that image. One, two, three. Good morning! Touch. Release. So I'll just uh, brief recap. So we were just talking about mind-body connection, samajh awaste. J limited understanding hoye chhe ke yes, if I take care of my physical self, my mind-body connection will kick in. So um, that's just one way of looking at it. But until apne we don't look at our mental health, the physical health also does not uh, respond accordingly. Ne me example apelu ke mara ek uncle che jene. He just loves doctors. And I can't be hoi shetok. I'm a doctor parcel age, I'm a doctor parcel age, I'm a doctor parcel age. But di goli ok hai che, but still he still feels complaints ke I don't feel good. So you know, ek vajay hase ke andar si kai je kaam karwaan ho shetana thik kari raha hai haji sudhi. So there are three techniques, the NLP ni beej hai and then there's another third technique. Which I was just on the first one which is anchoring as a technique. A technique ma, sorry sahib, a ma ek forefinger of the right hand le vanu hoi che and the first knuckle of the left hand. And I just like to add here that I'm using this as an anchor point because it's easy to touch. If you say that no, I feel a point in my elbow is easy for me to touch, a point behind my ear is easy to touch, it's any point which you feel is comfortable for you to access easily and touch. But I just felt that this would be easy to demonstrate on and that's what we use even for our coaching interventions. So, Emma, good morning na words line. Internally positive ek emotion, we have to, uh, our technique ma, you can associate an internal positive emotion with an external anchor. So, external anchor aache. The internal emotion je hume use kari rata was feeling totally motivated and totally charged. Ena was say hume good morning, totally motivated and totally charged we take kari rata. So, we are going to do it two more times since Sairi Sab has just come. So, let's just do it. Two more times, remember, one, two, three, you're accessing good morning, but you're also accessing that internal positive emotion of being totally motivated, totally charged, blow it up, feel what you feel, see what you see, hear what you hear, on the count of three, one, two, three, good morning! And touch. Release. And just one last time. Again, you're accessing the same emotion, one, two, three. Good morning! Touch and release. Thank you so much. Now what happens? Now don't do anything, don't say anything, but just take the same forefinger and take the same knuckle and touch. Now I can bet for some of you, if not all of you, in your ears you would be hearing the word good morning. And in your heart, somewhere in your mind, you will be feeling a rush 
of feeling motivated and feeling charged. Now imagine this with only doing it about two to four times. Now if you stack your anchor, we call it stacking the anchor, every time you feel motivated and charged, because we do feel motivated and charged, sometimes we are playing with our kids, we feel motivated and charged, we're having an exciting day at work, we feel motivated and charged, we're cooking a really uh, yummy dish at home, we feel motivated and charged, you can stack your anchor. Then come one day when you're feeling demotivated and you're feeling like, ah, meh, just not with it today, you can access your anchor on demand. So this then is a technique of associating an internal positive emotion with an external anchor and being able to use it on demand. What does this do? It's a mood lifter, it's a stress buster, and it provides mental clarity, which obviously aids overall health. Now with patient care, when you're with, a with your patient doing your assessments and looking for physical symptoms, also look for their feelings and emotions and fears. And better still, ask about them. What are you afraid of? What are you feeling these days? What's, what's your reaction to what you're going through? This will give you a good idea about the kind of positive anchors you can create for your patient by a word, a gesture, or a touch. For example, when I was sharing with you my story, I was visiting a um, you know, an elderly Gujarati lady, and every time I finished my visit with her, she would say, Are dikra, tu to ghani mas che. And I would always leave her uh, office feeling very upbeat and hopeful. And trust me, I forgot the day she stopped saying the words. She used to just do this. But every time she did this, for me, it was, Are dikra, tu to ghani mas che. And I felt upbeat and hopeful. So this is the way you can integrate this with patient care and also obviously can use it with yourself as well. So that was the first technique. The second one is language and self-talk. We all talk to each other, but we also talk to ourselves in our head. And that is what we call self-talk. Now there's one important thing I want to share with you with regards to this, that is, the unconscious mind finds it difficult to process negatives. The unconscious mind finds it difficult to process negatives. Let's demonstrate this again. So I have one humble request of all of you. I want you to do anything, but please do not, please do not think of the Statue of Liberty. Do anything, but please do not think about the Statue of Liberty. No Statue of Liberty. <laughs> exactly. I think all of us will agree that in order to not think about the Statue of Liberty, you have to think about the Statue of Liberty. That's because the unconscious mind does not know how to not think about the Statue of Liberty by first not first thinking of it because the brain finds it difficult to process negatives. It has to first create the positive of it, then delete it and make it the negative, right? So imagine using this information in our communication with our children. Instead of saying, don't cross without looking, how about saying, stop, look and cross? With our team members, instead of saying, don't be late, how about saying, be on time? With patient care, instead of saying, don't eat sugary foods, how about saying, limit sugary foods or stop eating sugary foods altogether depending on what that person needs to do. So what this does, what this does is, it allows the mind to take in information with more ease and clarity. It allows a mindset which is more ready for positive change. And obviously we know if a mind is ready for positive change, what happens? It's going to affect your overall health too. And most importantly, most importantly, what does it do? It takes away the risk of a negative statement being processed wrongly just because the brain could not delete it.
And the third one, the third one is not so much a technique, but it is a request. It's a request from all of you esteemed professionals to change the narrative and make this an inclusive endeavor. What should we make an inclusive endeavor? And I'd like to share another incident that happened with me, I want to say about six to seven months ago, when I was invited for a similar uh, medical event. And the lady who called to invite me said, it would be really nice if you can come because it will be a good addition to the event. Now, my thing is that mental health is not a good addition to physical health. It is an integral ingredient of physical health. And therefore, I urge you to partner with mental health practitioners, be it psychologists, counselors, therapists, because all of these people will add a comprehensive care plan for your patients. Mental health referrals are very, very effective for patients who are going through chronic pain, uh, any stress-related disorders, and any conditions with strong mind-body connections. So lastly, let's integrate this information to such an extent that we all become more amazing mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, daughters, sons, individuals, as well as, yes, doctors too. And what information? Just as a quick recap, what is this one? Anchoring. anchoring. And what does anchoring do? What does it do? It allows you to associate a positive internal emotion, it could be any emotion, with an external stimulus or anchor. And what was this one? The self-talk. Remembering that the brain does not find it difficult to process negatives. Therefore, tell yourself or someone else what you want them to do rather than telling them what you don't want them to do. And third, as I said, was not so much of a technique as it was a request to change the narrative and make it an inclusive endeavor. In conclusion then, by embracing holistic health that recognizes the profound mind-body connection enables us to become more effective individuals as well as healthcare providers. And all it takes is a more proactive and integrative outlook. And then as a bonus, what happens? As a bonus, you smile from the inside out Mona Eduasi, just like I do today. Thank you. Good morning, Let's apne ekwar kariye, sagla. Again, we are anchoring the same emotion. Remember, we are doing feeling motivated and feeling charged. So see what you see. Remember these statements. See what you, because that adds to the image in the head. See what you see, hear what you hear, feel what you feel, add volume to it, make it loud, make it larger, exaggerate that emotion, make it big, make it big. One, two, three, assalamu alaikum and touch. And release. So yeah, if you do that, inshallah, we will be all motivated for a long time. Thank you. I'd like to now hand over to my friend and colleague, Zainab Bain, who will enlighten us further. I sometimes use a similar method when I associate with say with every breeze I feel relaxed. So you know Yes. you know, I just concentrate on my breathing. I'm being breathing some relaxing. So it's not a touch, but it's just a sensation of something different. And in our sit sabkai check it's either a gesture a word or a touch. So whatever connects or resonates with you. If a gesture connects, like even just doing this sometimes evokes an emotion. Um, so for you, it could be the breath. 
Absolutely, sir. Yes. Thank you. Hello? Hello? So good morning, some night shift? Okay. I'll connect Karwan, which way? Okay. Um Bismillah Rahman Rahim, uh Tasiman. So uh Shukriya Sagani Ababa State Tasimat. Um Aj J Tasiman ye uh Hamna mind body connection nu Hamna Kide Ruche to now we're moving into the communication. Piece. So uh, today we're going to talk about the five E's of health literacy and uh, specifically effective communication for your clinical practice. So we'll talk about health literacy. What is it? Uh, what are the potential impacts of using health literacy best practices? And then five hopefully simple ways that you can integrate that into your clinical practice. This is the Okay, so before we get into all of that, I really just wanna emphasize the trust that you as healthcare professionals, uh, specifically here it says doctor in, the, in this uh, poll, but really any of us who have that one-on-one -on -one relationship with a client, with a, with a patient, um, you are in a position to have more trust than the CDC, the FDA, uh, state and local public health uh, officials, and various uh, political leaders. So 94% of people trust their doctor. So, and I know, I know you have such limited time and you have 15 minutes. So that brief time, how can we really make the most of it? That's what we're gonna talk about today. Okay, so what is health literacy? Okay, does, it, does everyone know what it is? Has everyone, who hasn't heard of health literacy before? I'm curious. Okay, who has heard of it? Okay, because I don't, I don't want to put you all on the spot. I have to do positives. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> Tasimin. Maaf kar jo. What is it? Haji samaj nati pari deo. Barabar che. Okay, okay, that's good to know. So, so what is health literacy? Health literacy is whether or not people know uh, how to find, understand, and use health information or services to make informed decisions about their health and take informed actions about their health for themselves and also their loved ones, you know, their family members and things like that. So what does that really look like? Uh, there's two, two big uh, chunks of health literacy. The personal, so that, that might be what comes to mind, right? Uh, whether someone can read a medication label, uh, whether they can access the patient portal that they need to communicate with you or refill prescriptions, whether they can find healthy recipes on the internet. You know, if they have diabetes, like what kind of recipes can I make? And then on the other hand, there's the organizational, right? So the system, the health system that we're a part of and how complicated it is and how confusing it is. And, um, and so, that, so what do we do from the organizational standpoint for health literacy? We can provide easy, easy to understand medication labels. We can uh, maybe give a demo, you know, this is how you, you can use your patient portal. Does that happen most of the time? Not really. Um, or maybe we can say, oh, here are some diabetes friendly recipes that you can use, you know, so people aren't just going into the wild, wild west of the internet. Uh, so th did that clarify a little bit more what health literacy means? Okay, so this is a, a health literacy technique called teach back. We'll go more into it, but I just want to give an example of something, anything. Think of like an intervention or a medicine or something that studies have associated with improve patient satisfaction, improve quality of, quality of life, improve health outcomes, and I'm just putting one, uh, but this is um, glycemic control in diabetic patients, so blood sugar in a good range. And then um, quality, like a reduced 30-day readmission, you know, for people who get uh, some sort of uh, discharge instructions for a surgery, for example, really no harms or risks uh, that can be associated with it. And I know this is the kicker for you all. Re, uh, study, at least one study has shown that the time uh, spent doing this intervention doesn't have a significant difference in the time without it. So it actually doesn't take more time in the clinic. However, um, only the, according to the most recent data of 2020, 
only about 27% of patients receive this intervention. Okay, so imagine if this was a, like a medicine or something, like pharmaceutical companies would be all over this, right? <laughs> like, but it's not, so you know, it might not be given that importance. Um, and so some might say this is a missed opportunity, right? But I think this is a golden opportunity and I think we should take it. So without further ado, um, here are the five E's to communicate with ease. So we have explain jargon, ensure understanding, that's the teach back component, uh, equip with trusted resources, encourage questions, and then lastly, to connect back with Desimin, use empathy. Oh, so what's explain jargon? So you might say, okay, now I have to stop using big words, right? My patients won't understand. I wouldn't recommend that because that is important for them to know what the words are. So instead of just uh, not mentioning the jargon, make sure you're explaining it. So if you say something like, hey, you have a stroke, you have to explain, okay, that's bleeding that happens in your brain. You might also be, and it might also be called cerebrovascular accident. You can give the acronym because they might see the acronym and not know what it means, so CVA. Um, and then this is the type of stroke you had. It was caused, you know, it's ischemic stroke. It was caused by a blood clot that blocked a blood vessel in the brain. And then here you can use a tool or a visual to say, okay, here, see, this is the clot and it's blocking the blood flow in this region of the brain. You know, so because people, they learn in different ways. So I actually have the book um, that this is from. This is an ER doctor who is an artist and they developed this as like a bedside tool. So I re recommend this book, Diagnose Sketch. Um, and it'll be linked at the end, like all the resources I talk about, you can uh, download. So that's the first tip. A diagonal sketch, D-I-A-G-N-O, and then the word sketch. And uh, yeah, it's pretty good. You can look through it too if you want to. Uh, so this is an activity. Uh, so if you can go to menti.com on your phone, and let me pull it up, menti.com, and then put in this code 4869, 2739, sorry, it's really small on the screen, but 4869, so menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. So raise your hand when you're on menti.com. Okay, we have some mentees. Okay, and then the number 4869, Okay, so I'll start explaining it, um, and if you need me to repeat the number, just let me know. So lay jargon, so you might think of jargon as these long words that are super multisyllabic words, but there's also lay jargon, which is basically a word that means something different in a medical context than it does in the real world. You know, so one classic example is stool. So, you know, in the real world, <laughs> stool is a kursi, a type of kursi, um, but in the medical context, you know, there's a lot of different words for it, but um, basically stool is like, you know, feces or, you know, you have to give a stool sample for a certain test, right? So patients might think when you say stool and they might think of this chair as opposed to that they have to, you know, basically give, uh, you know, what's colloquially known as you know, a poop sample, essentially. Okay, so we have stool. That's, thank you, <laughs> whoever submitted that. Negative, okay, that's a really good one. Appreciate. So yeah, there's uh, other ones, um, unremarkable. <laughs> attending is one that's pretty common. Like what is it? Attending, we pr or attending of an event versus like the doctor that's overseeing other doctors, right? So yeah, some of these might be going over my head because I'm not a clinician, but, but you, all, you get the point, right? There's, a, there's jargon in different ways, and we really can't make assumptions about what patients know and don't know. All right, so we'll move forward. I think, uh, thank you, resident. Yeah, those are really good. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. So, change. 
Okay, so tip two, and this is my you know, favorite thing, ensuring understanding. So this is the teach back technique that I showed you that was so awesome a few slides ago. What does that mean, right? We're, when we're doing teach back is essentially asking the patients after we've given them some information, maybe it's a medication change or something like that, we ask them, okay, so now when you go back home, well, first I'll explain it. It's basically asking to recall the information that you've given them and ensure that they've understood it correctly. Okay, does that make sense? You're just asking them to repeat back what you just told them and making sure that that was correct. It's really that simple, y'all. <laughs> it's really that simple. So this is an example, and you wanna make sure that they know that it's not a test of them, it's a test of you, right? So how do you do that? So you'll say, you know, I know we've covered a lot of information today. Um, I wanna make sure I did a good job of explaining myself to you. So in your own words, can you uh, tell me how you're gonna take your medications when you get home? How are you gonna explain this to your husband or your spouse or your child, for example? So let's say they say it and it's like, okay, everything's right, okay. Mon uh, morning medication, my girl, right? <laughs> you know, so you would say, okay, you know, I think I need to do a better job of explaining the morning medications. Is it okay if I re-explain that part to you? And then the key is when they re-explain, or when you re-explain, close the loop. Make sure then you confirm that understanding so that they have the full 100% correct. Because you all know, making a medication error can be life-threatening. Right? And we're just allowing those things to happen potentially because of miscommunication or misunderstanding. So that's teach back. Uh, tip number three, equipping with trusted resources. Right, We know we're gonna tell the patient something about a diagnosis, and then they're gonna go home and ask Dr. Google, you know, could I not get it? Ask Dr. ChatGPT. So, <laughs> you know, that's all the new things that are coming out right now, and we can't trust those sources, right? Um, so what we want to do is equip with trusted resources. Teach a man to fish, or give a man a fish, you know, feed him for one, one day, teach a man to fish, feed him for a lifetime. So you have the opportunity to teach them how to fish for trusted health information. Telling them where's the right lake to go to, you know, where's the right pond. Stay away from this one. This one is full of, you know, people who don't know what they're talking about. So one, one uh, example of this is Medline Plus. It's by the National Library of Medicine. It essentially has like pretty much every drug you can think of, you know, the side effects, everything written in plain language, simple language. It's in English and Spanish, so um, highly recommend this. And then you all know best, right? If you're a cardiologist, where are the trusted resources? If you're a you know, pediatrician, where are the trusted re resources, right? So you can do your own research to identify those trusted resources within your realm. And then encourage questions, right? And there's a, a, a better way to do this and a not as preferred way to do this. Um, what the preferred way would be to ask open-ended questions. So what questions do you have for me, right? They, they can't answer just no to that, uh, as opposed to do you have any questions? No, right? Like, and they might feel like, I don't wanna waste your time, let me just say no and move on. Right, but what, saying what questions do you have for me really encourages and invites those questions to actually happen. And then you reduce the risk that they leave with any sort of lingering confusion or concerns. Which will come back to you in your inbox, your in-basket, as <laughs> you know, so. I'm trying to make this, you know, like really tempting for y'all to do. And then uh, finally, use empathy. We're connecting it back to Desimin's uh, excellent presentation, when the emotions are high, when the fear is there, when this, you know, uh, confusion is there, all of those things, the, the cognition ability and the ability to process the information is gonna be very low. And so at that time, giving information is like, there's no point, right? But if you can acknowledge the emotions, I'm so sorry you're going through this. Like, it sounds so frustrating that you're having migraines and it's interfering with your work. Right, if you're able to acknowledge that emotion, it kind of like, you know, dampens that down and you can move forward and say, you know, let's figure this out together. Like I'm on the team with you, let's figure this out. Um, and that, I think that kind of opens the door for all this information to come in and for them to make those informed decisions and take those informed actions. Um, and I know from my personal experience, even having uh, some doctors tell me like, I know uh, I have so many other patients who have, who have this, you know, issue or problem and, 
like they're, they've gotten better, they're leading a great life, and so will you. You know, so that hope, if you're able to give that hope and reassurance, like it's even more, it's as much, if not more, therapeutic than the daba, the treatment that you're providing. So with that all being said, um, take out your phones again, please. And, you know, I know we've gone through a lot of information today. And uh, in order to make sure I did a good job of teaching you the five E's, I would like to request if you can please tell me how you would plan to implement one of the five E's when you go back to your practice. Do you see what I did there? <laughs> so again, that's M-E-N-T-I dot com. And then the number is 4869-2739. Okay. So we'll take time to explain jargon, especially in liver transplant patients. Yeah, that, I can only imagine how complicated that must be. Ask them to teach back, be an ally for them. Teach back, more teach back, list of trusted resources, equip with resources, what questions do you have for me? Looks like I did a, did a pretty good job, to be honest. <laughs> more reliable sources for self-care, right? So equipping with the mental health resources. I mean, I wish that more of my, my you know, uh, providers were able to say, realize like, hey, it seems like this is affecting your mental health. Let me refer you, let me give you the resources. So that's really important. Awesome. Well, shukran sagra again. Um, just wanted to close with um, also trying to practice what I preach. Sorry, where's wrong? Is it this one? કમ્યુનિકેશન <laughs> તો એ હેલ્થ લિટરસી કનેક્શન છે જે હમે જે એ લોકોને ઇન્ફોર્મેશન આપશે એનાથી એ લોકો ઇન્ફોર્મ ડિસિઝન બનાવશે તો ધીસ કમ્યુનિકેશન ઇઝ વન ટૂલ હેલ્થ લિટરસી ઇઝ વન ટૂલ અને સાહેબ એક્ચ્યુઅલી જે વાત થઈ કે અરુસેન ભાઈને જે અમે કીધેલું કે એમાં એન્કરિંગ જે અમે આપણી ટેકનિક છે કી કેન ઓલસો બી યુઝ વિથ ધ ચિલ્ડ્રન બીકોઝ વોટ ધે આર ડુઇંગ સમટાઇમ્સ વન ધે આર સ્ટ્રેસ્ડ ઇઝ ધેર લુકિંગ એ ક્વિક ફિક્સ વાત છે જે ક્વિક ફિક્સ છે જ નથી પછી તો એ લાઈફ ટાઈમ વાસ્તે એમાં આવી જાય છે સો આ જે ટેકનિક છે ઇવન ઘરે બચ્ચાઓ સાથે બી થઈ શકે છે સો દેર ધીસ ઇઝ ધેર સ્ટ્રેસ બાદ છે ધીસ ઇઝ અ વે દેટ દે કેન કમ ટુ યુ એન્ડ જસ્ટ વિદાઉટ સેઇંગ એનીથિંગ જસ્ટ વિથ અ જેસ્ટ ઓર જસ્ટ વન વર્ડ ઓર અ ટચ એ ફિલિંગ્સ રી ઇન્ફોર્સ થાય છે જેનાથી એ લોકો સપોર્ટેડ ફીલ કરશે એ લોકોનું સ્ટ્રેસ થોડું એલિવેટ થશે યસ વી હેવ અ ફ્યુ મિનિટ્સ ફોર ક્વેશ્ચન્સ 
What questions do you have? <laughs> uh, okay. Yes. 